There is a very popular idea that the 10 avatars or incarnations of the Hindu god Vishnu or the Dasha avatar is parallel to the theory of evolution propounded by Charles Darwin. Sadhguru definitely thinks so. 15,000 years ago, Adi Yogi said this, the first form of life on this planet was in water. Is that true? And if it's not, where do we know about the sequence in which the life forms evolved on Earth? Was there some discovery that we made that helped us answer this question definitively? Let's talk about all this in this video, shall we? Hi, my name's Pranav and you're watching Sciences Do. I'll link that video you saw down in the description, but basically in it, Sadhguru says that Adi Yogi, who lived about 15,000 years back, talked about how life originated in water, represented by the Matsya avatar of Vishnu or the fish, and then came onto land, represented by the Kurma avatar or the turtle, which is apparently amphibious. Second development on the planet is amphibious life, Kurma avatar. Half in the water, started picnicking on the land. By the way, that's not true at all. Turtles are not amphibious. They are reptiles that evolved on land. And the sea turtles moved back into the oceans. And the tortoises that evolved alongside them stayed on land. The evolution of amphibious life happened much earlier than that. Clearly, Sadhguru has no idea what he's talking about. But this little nuance about turtles is not the main point here. It's about the theory of evolution. He goes on talking about how then came the mammals with the Varaha avatar or the boar and then the Narasimha, half man, half beast, and then the human forms Vamana, Parashram, Rama, Krishna, and Buddha, and Kalki, who is a form that's supposed to come in the future. Anyway, you should watch the original video. It's hilarious the claims he makes and how confident he is while saying stupid stuff like, If uh, people go to hunt a wild boar or something, you can't kill it easily. It doesn't die easily because it's so rooted in its physicality. Not sure what that has to do with evolution. Again, he talks about how man went from this dwarf man to uh, an emotionally volatile man. Next is Vamana, means a dwarfed man. Next is Parashurama, a full-fledged man, but explosive and uncontrolled, volatile. So volatile, he lopped off his own mother's head. Again, not sure what that has to do with evolution. But he compares this whole thing to Darwin's theory of evolution and claims that Adi Yogi said this 15,000 years back. In many ways, this is running parallel to Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin's theory of evolution is only 152 years old. Adi Yogi spoke about this over 15,000 years ago. With the intention of saying, hey, we yogis knew about this 15,000 years back, you scientists are only learning it now. <laughs> It's when I see this kind of ridicule of science by people who confidently try to replace it with their own silly, stupid ideas that I feel it's fair for the gloves to come off, for me to be a little harsh. First of all, this life originated in the water and then became amphibious and then we had reptiles and mammals and then we had humans. This is not Darwin's theory of evolution. But of course, you can't expect Sadhguru to know that. He just wants to misrepresent science and get an applause or a laugh from his audience, which he did. So what is Darwin's theory of evolution? He basically said that those traits which help an animal increase its chances of survival in that environment and help it reproduce and pass on those traits to the next generation are the ones that get selected. In other words, the traits in an organism are naturally selected to suit its environment something popularly known by the phrase survival of the fittest. I've spoken about it in detail in this video. This natural selection is what we call the theory of evolution, not whatever Sadhguru says. But bro, I thought you were supposed to come at the beginning of videos. Fine, I'll give it to you that Sadhguru was wrong here, but, but life did originate in water first, right? Sure. And, and then came onto land and then became mammals and then became uncivilized humans and then civilized humans. Okay, so that is the sequence of Vishnu's Dasha avatar. So Hindu mythology did get it right, right? This is something we need to talk about. The first thing that we have to get rid of is this notion that people can simply acquire knowledge by sitting and thinking about things like Sadhguru says in this clip here. He did not go to Galapagos Islands 
and put things under microscope and look, he sat there with his eyes closed and saw that if you go deep enough into this, there is an evolutionary memory in this. If you're going to say things about the nature of reality, but you're not getting that information from some observation, then you have no evidence to back up whatever you're saying. So how do you know it's validity? The same problem exists when you compare the sequence of the Dashavtar with the sequence of evolution of life. The former is people's creative imaginations and the latter is from observation. Any similarity you find between the two things is you trying to fit one thing to match the other. Maybe because you want to try and assert the superiority of your religion by matching it with modern scientific discoveries. So how does science know this? What is the observation that I'm talking about? What is the evidence? The year is 2004 and we are in the University of Chicago. Among the top professors at the university was Neil Shubin, a paleontologist. That is, someone who studies and works with fossils. The preserved remains of dead animals and plants that we obtained from layers of rock under the ground. He was obsessed with answering this question. How did fish evolve to live on land? And had so far led several unsuccessful expeditions to answer this question. Shubin knew that rocks dating back to 385 million years contained fossils which displayed fish-like characteristics. He also knew that rocks dating back to 365 million years contained fossils of animals that could live on land. He knew exactly where to look next. How do you know where to look for a fossil? I mentioned earlier that fossils are found in layers of rock under the ground. These rock layers, provided they are left undisturbed, are arranged sequentially in chronological order. What this means is that depending on which rock layer we get the fossil from, we know how old it is and this age can be cross-checked with radiometric dating. For example, the fossil of an early human and a velociraptor can never be found in the same rock layer. Since they lived in different geologic time periods, separated by 65 million years. This concept about the age of fossils was developed by George Escoffier and William Smith in the early 1800s. Back to Neil Shubin's story. In one final expedition, he zeroed in on 375 million year old rocks in the Canadian Arctic in search of his holy grail. Braving blizzards and the extreme cold and the threat of polar bears, his efforts paid off when he and his team discovered the fossil of an animal that had features of a fish and the features of a four-legged animal but wasn't exactly either. This fossil, later named Tiktaalik, was the one that eluded Shubin for decades. The transition between water and land animals. Such intermediate features in fossils help establish evolutionary continuity and help contribute to our understanding. It's not only this particular fossil that tells us about the evolution of life. We've been discovering fossils and dating and sequencing them since the 1800s and we've known that life went in the sequence from aquatic to amphibious to reptiles and mammals. Nobody can sit with their eyes closed and figure all this stuff out like Sadhguru said. He said there with his eyes closed and saw that if you go deep enough into this, there is an evolutionary memory in this. It's not only the evolution of life that you can learn this way. Uh, scientists in Antarctica dig up, drill holes in the ice and dig up ice cores. When we drill down through the ice sheet, we're drilling further and further back in time. We drilled an ice core that was 364 metres long and the ice that we recovered from the bottom of that ice core is over 20,000 years old. This is what they use to study climate change over time. They use bubbles and pockets of air that are trapped in the ice to learn what the atmosphere was like at that time. But instead of all this fascinating science, some people would rather listen to Sadhguru spewing random nonsense about how Adi Yogi sat and thought about it and figured out evolution by sitting and meditating. No, you need to observe before you conclude. And fossil evidence is how we know about the sequence of life forms that came before us. And if anyone tries to tell you that uh, people can sit with their eyes closed and come to this conclusion and that you can be enlightened like that yourself, please tell them to kindly f*** off. 
Whenever I hear people promoting these kinds of ancient science claims from their religion and mythology, I listen intently because it's funny to hear them justify it. So this is nothing but a good example of how metaphoric language was used to simplify something complex which later gets construed as a superstition. People were stupid back then so we used all these stories and metaphors so they could understand but now that you are all smart we can tell you finally that we were talking about evolution all along. These are people for whom appreciating the art and culture and creativity of these stories is not enough. They also need to validate it using science. Don't waste your time with them. And if you're a Sadhguru fan, don't forget to hit that dislike button. I'll see you in the next one. Till then, remember, science is dope.